Uh, can everyone hear me clearly? Good. Um, oh yeah, great. Thank you very much, Nelson, for your kind in introduction and also um, great. I'm very grateful for offering me this great opportunity to be here and talk about my book. I also like to thank Lucy and Mar uh, Michael uh, to be here and participate in these um, seminars and appreciate for that. Um, first of all, I'd like to use this opportunity to thank many people who has been very influential in my life and also in this project in different ways. As Nelson has uh, just briefly introduced, so a lot of people uh, in the past several years, almost maybe a decade, has been influenced in different ways and helped me and also nourished me in different things, including Nelson and Tazim and Dean McCannell being here, uh, Michael Rowlands not here, and uh, Peggy, and also Lucy, and I appreciate for everyone in, in this past lives. I know scholarship, academic, is a long journey. I appreciate all different kind of possibilities of encounters uh, among all of you, and thank you for that. Before the presentation, I would like to acknowledge the Noongar people, the traditional custody of the land on which I sit here in Canberra, Australia, and also pay my respects to elders uh, wherever you are in the past. I know you are everywhere in the world. So in the past, present and the future. In Australia, which is a settler colonial country, we caught this statement as an acknowledgement of the country. But it's not a simply a public statement. It's an important and performative ritual in the spirit of reconciliation and to acknowledge the heritage of the land and their communities. This is particularly important and relevant to today's talk on heritage and tourism. So as Nelson mentioned, this book examines the key political and ethical issues that emerge through heritage tourism. The research mainly focus on cultural heritage, although I understand that nature is also an important component of heritage. The book concerns culture, ethnic and ethical and political aspects of heritage tourism, not as simply just as a short-term social cultural phenomenon, which we often re refer to uh, a cultural industry. But in this book, I discuss possibilities of heritage tourism as a project of long-term process of co-creation that facilitates exchange and emancipation, which are the keywords of today's talk. So the book was uh, written when COVID just started, which transformed the world into a new normal. International and domestic tourism shut down in many parts of the world due to global crisis. So the past two years has been challenging for many of us. Why many scholars have um, doing research on um, predicting the future of tourism. I believe it's a time for us to review the past, the implications and the actual consequence of heritage tourism on our societies and also the earth. Therefore, the book look at both the past and future, which I phrase in the title of the book, problems and possibilities. Allow me to go uh, back a bit to the history of tourism studies, which most of you are familiar with. Since the early movement of post-war recovery in the 1950s, we saw the development of tourism industries as a business management to increase profitability. Um, and tourism studies at early stage was embedded in a professional discourse that legitimized and promoted efficiency, competition, and entrepreneurship. Since the late 1960s, a division has been created uh, in academia between tourism as a field of management and as a field of social studies. The latter concerns the social, culture, and the political perspective of tourism industry. So for instance, Sarah Newitz Jr., who graduated from UC Berkeley, wrote a paper, Tourism, Tradition, and Acculturalization. Mm -hmm week decimal in a Mexican village in 1963. This work is often credited as one of the earliest tourism related articles in American anthropological literature. Nelson once mentioned to me that 
Siren was student of George Foster at UC Berkeley, who asked him to write this article for a AAA meeting when he was on the job market. Yep. Since 1970s, interest is in the social and the cultural aspects of tourism has increased rapidly. To capture these research interests and development, while supplementing a gap in published materials, the Annals of Tourism Research was established in 1973 as one of the early journals to engage with tourism as a field of social science. So along with the publication of seminal work, The Tourist, as we know who the author is in 1976, and the host and guest in 1977, sociologists, geographers, and anthropologists such as Valen Smith, Nelson Graben, Dean McCann, Eric Cohen, and Edward Bruner set a precedent in tourism studies by considering the relationship between tourism and society. A large amount of new scholarship has since been develop developed along with wider sociological and anthropological uh, sorts and series such as embodiment, performance, gender, non-representation, post-colonialism, cosmopolitanism, mobilities, and pilgrimage. Since 2000, a further, a further critical approach has been developed to engage, sorry, before, to engage the tourism industry phrased as critical tourism studies. This trend was witnessed by the establishment of the journal Tourist Studies in 2000 and Tourism Culture Change in 2003 and by the organization of the first critical stud tourism studies conference by Etrovishk, Petrat, and Morgan in Croatia in 2005. As John Tripe summarized, critical tourism studies is a critics of existing positivist managerial paradigm and jump out of the hegemonic trap of tourism that is deeply embedded in Western capitalism and consumerism. The critical term of tourism studies focus on the force of domination, hegemony, and alienation, the practice and the particular of life experience, the values and belief and of the marginalized and unrecognized, and the potential for emancipation. Following the recent critical term in tourism studies, I identified two research agendas of critical approach to studying heritage tourism. And one is driven from the recent critical term of heritage studies. The first approach brings Foucauldian thoughts to challenging hegemonic power in the formation of knowledge production in heritage tourism. So recently, as we've seen in the heritage studies, there has been a discursive term that pays close attention to the knowledge efforts of heritage and its impact on society and people. So the political work um, heritage does um, is particularly evident in heritage policies and institutions that are rooted in the discourse dominated by the West. As a result, heritage professionals and experts institutionalize their methods of evaluating heritage through international organizations state and state actors, which creates a hegemonic discourse and understanding of the past. The second critical approach of studying heritage tourism calls for de essentialization pluralization, and emancipation. So critical studies of heritage tourism consider power in municipal, multiple forms and not just in the hands of the elites. It empowers communities that has been marginalized in the tourism discourse. Here, the idea of emancipation is not about radical social movements, but concerns the way liberalization and autonomy work to combat constraints on human identity and agency. It concerns the idea of freedom and liberty. A key concern here is that Therefore, the empowerment of local em communities to engage with heritage tourism and how their engagement is linked to their well-being and cultural identity. In particular, heritage tourism refers to the power relation between the local and the global, especially within the context of recognition, representation of the indigenous communities within a nation. 
Does tourism still serve a powerful instrument for post-colonial imperialism? Or does tourism function as a mechanism of decolonization and empowerment through self-knowledgement and self-governance? Further, can tourism offer indigenous people new avenues to reach out to the world in search of new allies and supportive connections and develop self-awareness and cultural identity, quote unquote. There are no simple answers to these questions. But like Tazim Jamal argued in her important book, Justice and Ethics in Tourism, heritage tourism is associated not only with consumption and management, but also with various uh, moral and ethical issues such as social inequity, dominance, civil rights, and human justice. So in the chapter three of my book, Politics of Heritage Tourism, review the impact of several global forces in the tourism in in industry on heritage sites and their communities. It shows how the Western ideological value system has become globalized and influential in non-Western countries. Tourism, particular post-colonial tourism, can create a, a colonial gaze to shape the relationship between local communities and public audience. So international organizations, tourism enterprise, and professionals all play important roles in facilitating the expansion of cultural imperialism. Unlike military dominance in the past, the hegemonic culture and economic influence is not created through physical control, but through ideology and value systems. This type of social control is more hidden than previous colonialization and is created within society as a consistent process of image building. So heritage tourism contributes to the operation, domination, misrecognition, and stereotyping of the host communities. More importantly, the ideas of an ideology created by these institutions has been incorporated into nation states to legitimize the pursuits of political, economic, and social cultural agendas. So for instance, on the border between North and South Korea, propaganda villages and the DMZ has been established in the name of unification to show a staged living environment of life from both sides. Another example is the recent development of red tourism or com communism tourism in China that exploits the historical heritage of China's Communist Party to sustain the national identity. Similar form of heritage tourism has also emerged in post-communist countries such as Hungary and Romania. To establish and legitimize national political regimes. Cultural narrative for heritage tourism often use some certain cultural techniques and strategies to fulfill their national political agendas. Three common practices achieve these political goals. First, remembering and forgetting certain histories to foster social cohesion. Second, regulating local, local lower class and minority groups through cultural objectification. And third, highlighting national narratives by separating heritage space from daily life. Sorry. These three strategies and implication have been shown in some of the industrial heritage in Japan. For instance, the official narrative of Hashima Island has been constructed to create a form of aesthetic of ruins without getting into details of stories about Japanese colonial history and abuse of forced laborers from Korea. In another word, amnesia or aesthetics of ruinous contributes to a collective form of nostalgia, a romanticized image of Japan, Japanese empire for the tourists to visit the island. Similarly, my early work uh, also shows that heritage and ethnic tourism in China sometimes serve as a form of romantic consumption. It offers tourists a sense of happiness and pleasure moment without seriously engaging with difficult or, or often traumatic past of local ethnic communities and their relationship with the central state. 
The official narrative of heritage tourism focused on hedge, uh, harmony, beauty, and romantic. Therefore, as heritage tourism is often associated with these group values and good effects such as beauty, pride, and profit, it is easier for the government bodies and professionals to create society consensus in decision-making during the prof prof process of production and management of heritage tourism. Then compared to other development projects, such as real estate industry or mining industry, the dominance of heritage tourism might be confronted with less uh, oper operation or resistance um, from the public as people are happy to accept the positive values. As a result, heritage tourism becomes soft, but powerful resource to depoliticize and to legitimize the space controlled by powerful agents, why the social and economic political interests can be reinforced by the dominance actors. <clears throat> in chapter four, I illustrate that international organizations recognize these problems and challenges. So in the past decades, they have developed and used certain concepts and practice such as cultural landscape in the intangible cultural heritage, and eco-museum, some of them has been studied by, by some of the audience here, in heritage tourism for cultural recognition and resource redistribution. We understand that cultural landscape recognize the indigenous perception of nature and culture. Intangible heritage recognize the value beyond material culture uh, and eco-museum focus on the community as a whole. So all of these pra practices have good intention to democratize and help local communities exert control over social, economic, and political factors, factors and effects that affect their lives. So heritage tourism can be made by the communities and used for the communities. However, the good intention of empowerment might not always lead to expected results on the ground. As scholars or and, and special anthropologists has been figured out that implementation of in these instruments around the world has often been confronted by different challenges generated by policy transfer, existing power structure within nation states, and also inter internal community politics within the communities, problems through generation or gender differences. Here, certain uh, methodologies such as anthropology or empirical research help us zoom in to the local scale and understand that communities are plural on the ground. And there are differences in terms of gender, generation gaps, and interests within the communities. So in chapter five, I suggest that heritage tourism should not be treated simply as an economic project or a propaganda for nation building, but an emancipation project that look for possibilities to advance liberty, dialogue, equity, and diversities. I discussed several issues here regarding possibilities of heritage tourism as a co-creation. The key issue of co-creation here is can heritage tourism move beyond the domination of certain ideologies such as nationalism, capitalism, and consumerism, and instead create a dialogue and fulfill equity, recognition, and emancipation. I believe help communities from each heritage site has their own homework to do to find their own task of emancipation. This task can be certain recognition of gender, race, and class equity, or they can be critical reflection of their colonial histories. So heritage tourism can serve as a decolonization project. Regardless, whatever the local task of co-creation could be, I believe that those intangible elements for local communities are the key issues, such as the issue of trust, empathies, and the idea of facilitation between inside and outside. Due to the limits of time here, I focus on the issue that about heritage interpretation. That is about a key issue to reconstruct our past in the present in the tourism context. Using the term hot interpretation, David Uziel moved from a detached objective approach to active 
and emotion-centered interpretation. Hard interpretation should not only invoke difficult feelings, but facilitate reflection and reconsideration of history as a form of public education. In this way, heritage tourism does not just force people, the visitors, to reach a conclusion during their travel, but evokes an open, inclusive, and a critical reflection of the nature of the past. Inspired by this approach, I take the position that heritage interpretation in tourism contests should aim to achieve five goals, which I phrase as the ladder of interpretation. On the first step of the ladder, heritage interpretation contributes to visitor entertainment and consumption. So visitors at historical enactment sites can become romanticized as a form of cultural production. In these scenarios, visitors might not be interested in the histor historical facts, but instead they might be attracted by a romanticized or a fun performance that serve the desire for experiencing the otherness. The first step can also refer to dark heritage sites where visitors are attracted by the atmosphere without recognizing the actual meanings and histories. So for instance, the right photo in, is one of the turn of between North and South Korea of DMZ area. When I visit this turn in 2019, I encounter a group of young students from South Korea who play hide and seek game during their school education trip without actually paying attention to the history. Here, I'm not saying that official interpretation of the history of this place by the South Korea government is authentic. But what I found here is interesting that the education tour ends up with a Disneyland-like experience that visitors focus on the present and they disconnect with the past. The second step of the ladder is knowledge and fact sharing. This step is often associated with official heritage description and narrative made by experts and professionals. Such official inf information typically incorporates historical backgrounds with the heritage site through a chronological order that includes years, dates, and events associated with the site. This type of information is present as a factual and emotional and objective. The third of step offers a deeper level of understanding and recognition. At this stage, provides answers to why and how certain historical events took place. As seen in the example of this Kung Fu Woman Museum in Nanjing, in China, the statue itself became a form of heritage interpretation that acknowledged the event's traumatic nature and and its impacts on affected communities. At this stage, recognition becomes a powerful cultural practice to establish the relationship between the related communities and the visitors. It recognized the trauma of the victims. The four steps of heritage in, in interpretation is about imagination and reflection. Unlike previous stages that focus on facts and knowledge, this steps enables visitors to travel the boundaries between heritage and memory that often involves process of imagination and reflection. So at one of the space in the Jewish Museum in Berlin here, phrased as Zalekhet, translated in English, fallen leaves, visitors standing in front of more than 10,000 heavy round icon, iron plates, which cut in the, front, in the form of faces with crying mouths cover the empty space. Instead of presenting factual truths, this form of heritage tourism highlights the emotional connection between visitors and the sites and its past, offering possibilities of imagination and reflections. Oral history sometimes can be powerful in terms of offering opportunities to immerse the visitors to connect directly with the communities. In one of the recent exhibitions in Australia, uh, for instance, multimedia and technology in the dome shape, which, which shown here in this slide, 
has been used to visualize dreams and song lines that represent the Australian First Nations cosmology. So when visitors sit under this dome and experience the dreams of the First Nation people communities, it's a bit like the transcendence in the religious context that mediate the visitors to travel spiritually in between different worlds without actually moving their physical bodies. The last step presents heritage tourism with an opportunities for healing and reconciliation. So heritage has the potential to offer a spiritual space for peace building and healing, particularly to individuals and groups impacted by the past loss and cultural trauma. This social function of heritage interpretation, interpretation is central to dark heritage tourism, connect to tra tragic events. Interpreting and visiting to these sites has the potential to offer peace, reduce conflicts between different groups, and foster reconciliation with divided societies. So we have seen that Nagasaki and Hiroshima has been reconstructed as a city of peace through memorials and tourism to commemorate the atomic bombing in the context of the Second World War. Reconciliation is also an important social political agenda in Australia between uh, the majority group of people and also the First Nation communities. So many Aboriginal arts festivals, heritage trails, and exhibitions recognize the importance of reconciliate Indigenous and non-Indigenous difference and histories. So why these four goals simplify the complex relationship of the actual world of heritage tourism? They illustrate various graduation of heritage interpretations and their contribution to tourism. Here, I do not intend to show such ladder as a linear development. Each goal targets certain form of tourism and not all tourism destinations requires to engage with, for, for instance, healing or reconciliation. So the ladder offers a general framework of interpretation pushing past code facts to encourage visitors and tourists to engage with the experience emotionally. Efforts towards the certain force goals such as healing and reconciliation require more emotional work in the interaction between visitors and the objects and the message behind the heritage tourism. Visitors so do not only focus on the present as a form of consumption, but engage with this experience as a form of value co creation, cultural exchange and relationship building between the present, past and future. I understand such form of carriage tourism is still challenging and sometimes easily can fall to superficial propagandas still without any meaningful impact on local communities and societies. As I said, good intention, might not lead to good consequence. For instance, at the old bridge as Mosta, which demolished during the Croat and Bosnia work, war, sorry, was reconstructed and nominated as World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 2005. So the post-war reconstruction of the bridge, which shown here, symbolize functions as a powerful emblem of international cooperation and peaceful unification between Bosnia and Herzegovina, two ethnic divided groups. However, the local recognition of the bridge as a unifying feature between these two political power is very limited, resulting in a locally hollow monument for tourism industry. Another similar example is the recent development of the Nanjing Mosque in Nanjing, China. The museum is a key national education and tourism destination to commemorate the victims that were killed during the Second World War. It was established on the local heritage sites in which victims of the massacre were originally buried. The museum used lots of new techniques such as participatory commemoration rituals, oral histories and uh, victims uh, interviews and visual materials and high technology to strengthen the tourism experience and facilitate 
reflection, and imagination. Peace building has also been incorporated into the play's main message. So you can see here that the peace statue has established in the entrance of the museum. And Nanjing has been branded as a city of peace recently. However, heritage tourism of the site still serves nation building practices. As we've seen from this place, the language display in the site as, at the site still contains as we, they pluralization to support the museum's political position and underlying national agendas. So in the museum site and also the, 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 the heritage place of the buried space, the notions of the we are framed as the children, the civilians, the woman, innocent and harmless victims who resist and now grieve, but who should be also forgive. Conversely, they are soldiers, mass cleaner, aggressors, invaders, rapists, ruthless and savage, capable of mass killing and violence, indicating the Japanese soldier. By focusing on we and they polarization, the site, this allows the visitors either domestic or international tourists, to learn from the past from multiple perspective, to provide open dialogues and reflection. The interpretation of the site offers a strong national sentiments, trapping visitors into an authorized ideology. And here, peace only serves as a tool of legitimacy and moral superiority. I understand that each country deals with heritage tourism and its interpretation in their own ways. And here I do not intend to embrace the Western narrative or democracy, nor do I argue that places like Mosta or Nanjing, China has an exceptional social political environment because there are no universal solutions here. Instead, my conclusion is that fulfilling emancipation of heritage tourism for understanding recognition and peace building cannot rely solely on advanced management and interpretation techniques that invokes tourists' emotion or feelings. The construction of interpretation of narrative for heritage tourism, particularly those difficult history or difficult past, requires assessments from the past from multiple perspectives to provide open dialogues and critical reflections, like what we did in the tutorial for the university's class. So we don't create hate speech or hate languages. As part of co-creations, visitors can, and the public can be invited to participate in open dialogue without authorized and dominate their voices and which could facilitate critical and reflective thinking about the nature of heritage. So the question can include, how did the past an event occur? How have people experienced? How have such issues been recognized and settled? And more importantly, how can we really learn from the past to create a better future? And in some cases, so we will not make similar mistakes. This last question is very important because it helps tourists move beyond the actual event to something more universal that people can really learn and think and share. I believe this is a cool issue of co-creation for, co for sharing and, 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 and mutual fertilization and nourishment. And I also believe this is a collective practice of moral and spiritual transcendence. Incorporating these questions in heritage interpretation is particularly important for enabling the social education function of heritage tourism to recognize the crucial hidden knowledge of the past. As I said in the beginning of the talk, this world now is experiencing global crisis. Why we embrace the benefit from digital platform to access and communicate each other without actual traveling like today, it is perhaps a good opportunity for us to think, stop traveling and think and reflect on the nature of heritage tourism and its impacts on human society and our earth. 
I believe this research is only the start of the journey, as we still encounter many new challenges or old challenges. For instance, the idea of liberty and emancipation might still be driven by Western values and ideologies. So the question is, how can we incorporate heritage tourism as a decolonization project in some part of the world with these value ideas, uh, sorry, Western ideas and ideologies? Are there ways to avoid imposing new Western dominant values, even they seem to be really good? More importantly, are there ways that we can go beyond human-centered vision of culture and history and to think about Earth as a geocentric being? Well, these are all parts of co-creation work that, sh that show all different kinds of possibilities. I really look forward to further critical and ethical discussions to review the, the consequence and possibilities of heritage tourism to our societies, to humanities, and to our earth. So thank you very much. I really appreciate for these seminars and discussions here. Thank you. Thank you, Yujie. Now, would you like, ah, oh, there we are. Okay. Um, we're on speak of you and uh, we have a truly international set of speakers today. Nobody's in the same country as anybody else. I would like to introduce Lucy Morissette. Uh, can you take over as speaker, Lucy? Yes, sure. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much, uh, Nelson, for having me. Thank you, Ujie, for uh, remembering me, although we haven't met for such a long time, and I miss you, really. And I really enjoyed uh, reading your book. So uh, I hope well, I'll be able to hear. You first, okay? Pardon me? Oh, I'll you want? Oh, you? yes. Yes, sure. We, we all know you, but not everybody <laughs> on the screen does. Uh, Lucy Morissette is the Canada Research Chair in Urban Heritage, a professor in the Department of Urban and Tourism Studies at the School of Management Sciences at UCAM, that is the Université de Québec à Montréal, and a researcher at CELAT, Centre de Recherche, Culture, Art et Société, a historian of urban planning, trained in the history of architecture and anthropology, and specializing in the study of the city and its representations. She is interested in the history of ideas and objects that make up the built landscape and works that with heritage as an agent of change. Her work addresses the relationship between identity and culture as manifested through discourses of the built, built environment, tourism practices and con conceptions of heritage. Recently, her research has focused on company towns and the role of heritage in local development in the context of deindustrialization, as well as the transformation of heritage processes uh, and the epistemology of heritage studies. And like all of our speakers today, she has a very large list of publications, but I will just uh, briefly say she is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and amongst her books are De la Vie au Patrimoine Urbain, 2010, Epistemology des Etudes Touristiques, 2013, and S'approprier la Vie, 2016. So a welcome from another time zone. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this, uh, what did you say, eulogy? in English. Anyway, uh, I apologize, everybody, for my French-Canadian uh, accent speaking here from uh, Montreal, where I should, as uh, Uji uh, did uh, on his part, I should uh, acknowledge that this home uh, where I'm situ situ situated, pardon me, in Montreal, is uh, on uh, on ceded land where long before uh, the arrival of the French and even longer before the colonization of French Canada by the British, uh, people of many indigenous nations came together and interacted. I wish to acknowledge here these nations, their descendants, and the spirit of fraternity that fostered peaceful relationship between our diverse communities. May it inspire uh, us today. 
Um, so I, I've taken a few notes. I hope I, I'm doing this in the uh, French tradition where I was raised, uh, at least where I did my PhD. So I, I hope I'll be uh, relevant here. And if I'm not, please shout, stop me or, or something. Uh, because I, actually, I would like to comment on, uh, as you said, uh, Uji, tourism as empowerment through built heritage. Uh, and think about social justice and what I call right to heritage in this uh, large uh, Disneyland that we all inhabit. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, Uji, you, you, uh, you comment uh, briefly on the, uh, the UNESCO World Heritage Status effect, observing uh, that, in fact, the list as uh, produced, as everybody uh, observes, uh, as produced a must-see uh, symbolic attractions in cultural tours. Uh, now, as you know, and as uh, Nelson just reminded us, uh, part of my training is as an historian of architecture, and it is in uh, that quality that uh, most of the time I work with local communities. And that made me think of an absence in your, however, very, very complete book. As uh, many works uh, in critical heritage studies and more and more in heritage studies in general, uh, your book figures heritage as a narrative. You clearly outlined that. And that is certainly a very, very productive approach that I do share as a scholar. But this epistemology tends to make the CHS, the, the Critical Heritage Studies community, consider mainly heritage as intangible, leaving experts in built heritage with a lot of positivism and doing a lot of damage by themselves. In uh, that line, I would like to underline that there is something else that heritage tourism does besides forging uh, narratives of history, of politics, of ethnicity and culture. It builds heritage, literally. Uh, I want to point this out, as you do also, uh, not, not to show a deficiency in your book, but to nourish uh, the discussion that you initiate, uh, specifically in chapter three, about such possibilities eh, that you bring and around the question of social justice and what uh, I call, uh, for my part, as I just said, the right to heritage, which uh, matches, I believe, which matches your proposal of an equal access uh, to heritage through tourism. So, so let me first add, I, I should have prepared a PowerPoint with this, but I think that the examples that I will use are in everybody's mind. If they're not, you can Google them uh, while I'm talking. I won't know. So, uh, uh, so I'd like to add to the examples uh, that you describe, and especially to that of Xi'an, uh, but with much older examples, and not older uh, as uh, older on a heritage narrative scale, but older on a placemaking scale. Uh, because that is what, as far as we can think of, as I just said, that is what I think tourism does. It creates heritage. And I want to insist on that aspect here. Now, of course, it creates codes that are added to places in order for them through the mechanisms that you described, UG, uh, it, it creates codes in order for places to be recognized as such. Uh, that's why uh, all historic places around the world have either a cannon or cannonballs or one or two historic cannonballs in many ways. I, I, I would love to, I'm actually, I, I'm dreaming of writing a book about those cannonballs everywhere, those invental invented cannonballs, but that's another topic. Um, but there are more, lar much larger examples of a massive retrofitting, retrofitting that in fact show that tourism does not only influence the way that places look. Uh, as a local phenomenon, uh, tourism profoundly remodels them. Uh, it, it is uh, through tourism, as in uh, Xi'an, but much earlier, uh, that place that nowadays uh, stand as standards uh, in heritage were endowed with heritage. Uh, I can take just three here. Um, uh, Brugge in Belgium, you know, the, that, that, that city there, this, uh, this one. 
piece. <laughs> this is in French, sorry. Um, Brugge in Belgium that was completely rebuilt uh, in the uh, the 19th century. Uh, as you point out, UG, to, uh, to uh, embody a nationalist narrative as seen through the eyes of tourists who would accredit the whole mythology. Uh, it is the case also with the Mont Saint-Michel in France. Huh? Everybody knows the Mont Saint-Michel, deeply transformed, not to say completely remodeled at the end of the 19th century. And it is the case uh, of, uh, there are many other uh, cases like this. But it is the case also of uh, Place Royale in Quebec, uh, which you might know if you've read a few uh, a few articles that I wrote, uh, and which was completely rebuilt uh, following a project by the local Chamber of Commerce to attract tourists and according to the nationalist narrative of the Quebec government in the 1960s. Uh, Place Royale that is now as Mont Saint-Michel and Brugge uh, inscribed on the uh, World Heritage List. Now, while you, you bring uh, forward the notion of commodification, uh, that is, and I'm here quoting your page 24, uh, turning culture into a commodity, which is something that tourism and the whole heritage industry are often blamed for. Uh, I would say, uh, as I've said before, I, I would say that the point is not that there is tourism because there is heritage. I would rather say that there is heritage and I'm talking specifically about built heritage. I'm talking, I'm saying that her, there is heritage because there is tourism. And nor historically, nor today, would there be heritage if there were no tourism. Because it is through tourism that local communities have learned to invent and to pass on the heritage. Uh, Dean McCannell showed that very well quite a, a while ago. Um, it is through tourism that the communities have learned to pass on the heritage after decades of trial and errors. And it is through tourism that heritage has gained a social importance and thus has become desirable as what defines a community. And even, as you state very well, Uji, for some communities, or at least for some public authorities, tourism is the only raison d'être of preserving heritage, because, as you say, when you refer to Laura Jane Smith on your page 31, because, and I'm quoting you, uh, uh, ideas about heritage, conservation, and tourism development have become intentionally naturalized to the extent that the principles presented have become common sense. And one of such principles, uh, if I might add, is that tourism brings economic growth. Now, that, and I think we all know that, that is a smokescreen at the best. Uh, it is uh, not true that heritage tourism is profitable per se, and certainly not at least that it can financially support heritage conservation. In what uh, some people call developed countries, tourism does two things. It stabilizes the commercial place. That is, it brings in more currency and buyers to the local market, um, which increases the commercial supply and diversity for the local community in doing so, and by putting a place on international networks, tourism also creates desirability. People want to live there. And this is where the real mechanism of tourism enhancement through land speculation, of course, begins. It is no coincidence that UNESCO is mentioned in the promotional ads of real estate developers. This is exactly what happened to Liverpool, to mention an example that crossed the news recently because it was barred, as you know, from UNESCO's World Heritage List because of the development that being on the list brought to the Docklands, which was precisely the rationale being behind its nomination in the first place. That is to bring in the condition to redevelop an old obsolete and deindustrialized part of the city by bringing, by bringing to it a new life. Now, where it went wrong, this Liverpool case, is when heritage experts decided uh, something that they could have not done with Brugge or Mont Saint-Michel or Place Royale because the International Forum did not exist at the time. And experts 
had much less power then. Experts in Liverpool decided that the development through tourism and real estate and a few other things uh, we might say that uh, they decided that the development corrupted the heritage, which anyway could not, would not have existed without this dynamic. Old obsolete buildings are everywhere on the planet. That does not make them heritage. What makes them heritage is the project that the community has to consider them heritage and supported by the anthropological idea, which is the foundation of tourism, supported by the idea that this would be both specific and different, this make this heritage in the present time and for the future. We should always, and you do, UG, we should always consider heritage as a project and certainly not as a legacy of the past. Now, where it obviously doesn't fit either is in that this way of making heritage, as we have learned to do through tourism for over 100 years, this way of making heritage translates into a cascade of social exclusions. First, as you say very well, Uji, nationalist narratives are well known to do this, and you show that. Uh, but there is also, second, uh, a great social injustice because the added value created by heritage is not captured for the benefit of society as a whole. And there is a very big paradox here because what makes something heritage is that it is obsolete. It has not been modernized. Electricity has not, have not been installed. Toilets have not been installed in this old building because the financial means were not available. Something can become heritage because this is where poor people live before the heritage, of course, and not after. That's where I think the real commodification is, the commodification of poverty and the misappropriation of its own property for the benefit of other actors who will make it work to their advantage, usually to the exclusion of the poor who are still thought, and this is even worse, who are still thought not to have the symbolic or aesthetic needs shared by the rest of society. Now, you see, and you show us that, that there are solutions and that is what your book is all about uh, by outlining that heritage is not only, is not at all a question of access to heritage as the French thing, but is surely a question of equal participation to the production of the heritage. Participation is indeed one of such solutions. Participation to heritage, through the participation, through heritage narratives. Reversing the role and the status of the, the tourists, as you also mentioned, UG, uh, with uh, community tourism, uh, as also its advantages, uh, as with uh, ethnotourism, uh, as uh, it was practiced by anthropologists in the uh, 1980s and uh, 1990s. And eco-museums have also, as you mentioned, uh, eco-museums have brought very interesting solutions in rebuilding community heritage. And it will be uh, my pleasure to guide you to the Eco-Musée du, Fer du Fermont in Montreal when you come to uh, our uh, Industrial Heritage Reloaded Conference in 2022. But as far as uh, built heritage is concerned, all those solutions are still unsatisfactory in reversing the social injustice uh, inherent, inherent to heritage and thus more and more inherent to heritage tourism as a lever for redevelopment of obsolete places. If the co-production that you bring forward uh, is certainly a very promising avenue, it implies that we also rethink what is heritage at least what is built heritage. Because we, we consider heritage, and this is another legacy of the role of tourism in defining heritage, we consider heritage as a museum artifact, which is not well suited to built heritage. And I, will, I would go uh, so far as to say that the notion of cultural landscape consolidates this way of thinking, since it allows us to avoid considering heritage as a living space. A landscape is what you see, like a painting in a museum, not what you live in. 
if we want, as you uh, invite us, Uji, if we want to only address the question of redistribution of economic profit, and especially the economic profit gained through public ta taxation, which is at stake in the examples that I mentioned, we need to redefine what is heritage and how it should be addressed by public authorities. And surely we need to rethink it beyond the, the sacrosanct idea of culture, which always make things less serious and less important than they are. And in that rethinking, I believe you, G, in that, in that rethinking, the proposals that you bring in this book certainly uh, lay a very solid ground. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Lucy. As everybody can see, you are a very powerful speaker uh, and bring up some very important points and your French is just as good as your English. But uh, Yuji and I had the pleasure, I think also the last time we met was in Hangzhou at a critical heritage studies conference uh, where Lucy was the uh, opening speaker and she gave her half hour opening speech in Chinese. Uh, that made a lot of old white men very jealous. So here we are. Unforgettable, unforgettable in English too. Thank you very much. Uh, you will have a chance later to discuss this with the, the other two and then the audience. So I will introduce uh, Michael D. Giovane. Would you like to be a speaker and show your face and then I'll introduce you? Michael? I'm showing my face. I've had my face right, up the good. whole time. You're there. Uh, Michael Di Giovane is Associate Professor of Anthropology at Westchester University in Pennsylvania, an honorary, honorary fellow in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's also Director of the Westchester University Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology, convener of the American Anthropological Association's Anthropology of Tourism Interest Group, member of ICOMOS and its International Cultural Tourism Committee and a consultant for museums and heritage sites. His research spans Europe and Southeast Asia and focuses on tourism, pilgrimage, heritage, food, ways, and religion. Among his books, I cannot, like Lucy, go through them all, yeah, don't. <laughs> um, are The Heritage Scape, UNESCO World Heritage and Tourism, 2009, and with Rhonda Brulette, Edible Identities, Food and Food Ways as Cultural Heritage, 2014, and with David Picard, Tourism and the Power of Otherness, The Seduction of Difference, 2014. And most recently with Don Bojina de Uriate, Study Abroad and the Quest for an Anti-Tourism Experience. Yes. <laughs> Very interesting. He's a book reviews editor for Journeys and for the Journal of Tourism and Cultural Heritage. And he's the editor of Lexicon, the Lexington book series, Heritage, Mobility, and Society. And I won't go over the many times that I have no. met him, but one of the most delightful experience as a tourist was to visit Michael during his summer uh, uh, student uh, course on oh, yeah. food tourism in Perugia, where I was the tourist and watched uh, Michael and uh, his students who introduced me to the uh, food, markets, cooking, et cetera, in Perugia. So, Michael. There are a lot of those. Uh, I, I still remember Fatima when I had my baby, when my first kid was a baby and we all went to Fatima. That was great too. Uh, thank you for, for, for everything. It's, it's hard to follow both of these great, great presentations, very passionate presentations. I should also mention, so I'm zooming in from the greater Philadelphia area from Westchester University which is situated on uh, the land that, that is called the uh, Lenape Hawking, uh, the traditional ancestral homeland of the Lenny Lenape, the Delaware Indians. We pay respect to the Lenape past, present and future and to their continuing cultural heritage and connections with this homeland. Uh, you know, I, I didn't prepare anything um, uh, in particular because I did wanna have this kind of a fluid thing and there's so much that I could yeah, that I could really uh, say, especially also with, with, with Lucy's presentation. I think to marry the two presentations that we just saw, and actually, first of all, I have to say, Yuji, congratulations. This was, this was really an excellent book. Uh, it was, it was, it's enviable, you know, to have something that is so um, concise, that, that's so relevant, but it's so uh, ex expansive. You really touch on so many 
you know, different um, comprehensively, so many different topics that it was just really, really great. I mean, just the amount of, 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 of depth in such a in such a concise book too uh, will be definitely useful for so many people, and I think that that's really a perfect example of what what some of these new kind of publications, the shorter eighty page, you know, um, you know, highlights kind of a thing is. It, it's really really great. So I really uh, appreciate that. I mean, like like Lucy, I mean, I have my own little 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 things um, which I may or may not get to because I think you know, in listening to both of your presentations, the one thing maybe it's a critique, maybe it's a, something to point out. The way to marry these two, I think, is that maybe the title is, is mistitled. Maybe instead of heritage tourism, we should do what actually my handbook is going to do that you're contributing to, and I know Bert is and, and Tazim is as well, uh, heritage and tourism. And that and is really important because this is what came out to me when I was reading your book, uh, that you were talking about these these two um, separate but overlapping kinds of spheres that each have their own history, that each have their own structures, that each have their own rhetorics, okay? And that they, and we could see that too in just even the way that Lucy was talking, you were talking about intangibility, Lucy's talking about architecture and tangibility, uh, you know, there, there's, there's so much, right? That and is really important because it kind of references the complex overlappings and tensions and negotiations and mutualities uh, that, they, that they have, kind of like a Venn diagram, right? So there's some parts of uh, you know, heritage itself that has nothing to do with tourism. You know? And this is, I guess, where I would maybe like, you know, uh, want to qualify what Lucy was talking about a little bit. I agree that tourism uh, creates heritage in some situations. It certainly creates the value added that the, the, the heritage tourism gives to certain things and sites and, and practices. But there's things about heritage that, that are recognized by a family, you know, that's not recognized by others. What tourism maybe does, you know, in my opinion, Lucy, is amplifies that and expands it. It transcends what could be of local or, or even individual or family kinship value into a, into a broader sphere. And then, of course, it has all of these problems that UG uh, kind of kind of lays out. Um, you know, uh, but and the same thing with tourism too. I mean, tourism, you know, is this this temporary and voluntary and perspectival kind of, of, of interaction. Not all tourism is looking for heritage, right? I mean, not all tourism, there's that sand sea, you know, sun sex kind of tourism as well. Um, but so only some of this, you, you have this overlapping. There's also travel for heritage that isn't touristic, right? I mean, we as anthropologists travel, we could, we could argue as ethnographers are traveling to understand and interact with heritage in ways that we might want to distance ourselves uh, from the touristic, uh, you know, um, practices, even though we might, we might also engage in the similar structures. The same thing I talk about with pilgrimage. I mean, if you look at the emic approach, that bottom-up approach, pilgrims will tell you, and I've written about this too, that they say, this is pilgrimage, not tourism. They're engaging with their religious heritage in a way that at least they want to say is, is, is pure, less commodified, um, you know, above and beyond the, this sort of social sphere, regardless of whether it's true or not, right? I mean, we're talking about the meanings that they're espousing from the emic approach. So I think that, you know, in a way, all these tensions that we've heard between your two presentations and what I've read about in the book really has to do with this kind of this, this the fact that they're kind of two separate but overlapping and increasingly merging kind of a sphere. And I'll give another really quick example, you know, and I think you do mention this in, in, in the book as well to a certain extent, but I mean, the World Heritage Convention, right, does not mention the word tourism at all in 1972. It mentions one time tourism development and only as a threat is what they're quoted, a threat to heritage, right? And then you have, at, even earlier, you have the UNWTO, the World Tourism Organization, that is completely concerned with the political and the political economic kind of, I don't want to be crass and say promotion of tourism, but at least the management of this, this political and economic process. And never the twain should meet until about like the 2000s, right? The 2000s, you get the sustainability turn. Um, and that's where you see UNWTO especially starting to talk about sustainable tourism and ways that are kind of rethinking um, how we can make tourism more ethical, let's say, more just and good, 
Um, and that kind of brings them a little closer to kind of the goals of UNESCO. UNESCO, like, you know, I think Lucy also said really well, and Yuji, you know, uh, UNESCO is then recognizing that even though they kind of distanced themselves at, in theory in this utopian vision uh, from tourism, they're seeing that really they're the, a main driver of tourism. And so by 2015, I think it is, no, 20, yeah, 2015, I think there's a CM Reap declaration where they came together in Cambodia uh, to kind of sign a declaration that talks about sustainability a lot in a lot of their points, right? About how they can work together to make more sustainable kind of heritage tourism processes, right? Um, and, and, you know, one of the things, if, uh, if I could critique something, sustainability didn't come up much in, your, in, in the book, like the term itself, uh, it, the, the idea there, of course, right? But especially in this day and age when that's the big buzzword, I think that that's something that, that needs to be engaged with perhaps uh, uh, a, little bit, a little bit more because it's something that's also readily accessible. Just like your book itself is very, very accessible and very access it's a really wonderfully written book. Uh, you know, these kinds of terms are, are the things that people are thinking about uh, right now. Sustainability, and this is the other reason why I'm talking about this. Sustainability, if you think about, you know, what the UN's definition is, and I teach a class on, on sustainable food, uh, you know, you know, what we talk about is this, the three pillars or the four pillars, or the triple bottom line, or however you want to talk about it, where you have kind of economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, and social or sociocultural sustainability. The important thing that I try to have the students understand is that you're not going to get 100% social, 100% economic, and 100% environmental sustainability there's all kinds of different configurations that in a way are situational but all and which you you, you mentioned in, in you know that, that heritage tourism and, and and some of the prospects are situational and there's no one size fit all but also that it's dependent on the perspective of the the, the person who's making the policy or, or whatever right because I get a bunch of business students, you know, uh, school students in there, and they're really like focused on economic sustainability, and they're they're overbalancing that perhaps a little bit from the other ones. Um, this, in general, is kind of microcosmic of of ethics more broadly in general. And I know, and Tazim left. Uh, I know that you you know you you quoted you cited Tazim. You talked about ethics a little bit in, in the book, and you did qualify it a, a little bit. But I, I also want to kind of point out that the theoretical depth of, of ethics, you know, that, that I think was, wasn't touched on as much. You know, ethics and sustainability is, is, is an example of this, but so is, you know, heritage tourism and the things you're talking about. Ethics is different than morals, right? M moral action is uh, kind of, you know, what Durkheim would say is like adhering to like the norms in this very situational um, present day approach, like what do you do when you get something like this? Ethics, on the other hand, is weighing sometimes um, moral moral decisions that are complex and almost sometimes even, even conflicting at the same time, right? You tell the white lie. There are two different moral versions of that. Which one trumps which? Or how do you get around these, these conflicting moralities to make in the future something that's right just and good. That's kind of the definition of ethics is making things right, just and good for the future. And I think that's what your book is, is trying to talk about. How can we make this intersection between heritage and tourism better, more right, just and good? And not only is there, you know, it's situational to each, you know, different culture and everything else, but it's also situational on the perspective of the person that's doing the, 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 the ethical weighing here, you know, because we might have different ethical uh, principles or ideas, right? I mean, you, you know, are you a utilitarian? Are you seeing as right, just, and good for whom? For the most amount of people? Or, or do you not consider that you want to be deontological, right? You, like Kant and, and say it's, there's, there's just a moral, print, uh, an ethical principle and you can't move it even if it, you know, screws everybody up, you know, and, and doesn't, you know, do that? Or is it virtuous, you know? Is it about little steps, like Aristotle says, to make yourself, your behaviors gradually, like that ladder that you're talking about, build and build and build. So just the perspective of the person to whom the ethics are, are directed to, all of that stuff, you know, has to be balanced there. And so to talk, like, you know, like you did, you qualified these kinds of things of like empowerment and, and uh, what was the other big word, emancipation and stuff. That might be good for one situation. It might be good for one perspective, 
but it might not necessarily be good all the time for every person, even the, the, the concept, right? I mean, human rights itself is a very culturally conceived Western idea. Now I'm, I'm a Western person and I agree with that stuff, but that's not to say that everybody has the same idea of what is human rights or for whom or for what. And I'll give you just, you know, to, to kind of to, to pitch a little bit of, of, you know, the earlier webinar that I ran for the book in my series from uh, Shang Hong Feng, um, uh, Tourism, Prosperity in Meow Land. I loved, I mean, I, even before she published the book, she published that one article that I use all the time in my tourism class, Women's Work and Men's Work. I don't know if you ever read that, but it's a great book because what it, what it does is it says, look, tourism, as you know, the UNWTO touts, is, is supposed to be an equalizer, especially for gender. Um, there are more women employed in, in the tourism sector globally than men, like 56 or 60 percent. Um, and so they see this as a great emancipator, right? A great democratizer. But her, her work really shows that it actually creates even greater burdens because tourism as a, as a form of hospitality is considered women's work among the meow. So now women have to tend to the fields, tend to their family, and now work all in tourism. And then the men are disempowered and they have no job anymore and they feel worthless and there's a lot more stresses that go on. Right. So even though there's that empowerment of women through tourism, let's say it's it's changed the social dynamics in a way that maybe, you know, that's not necessarily the best thing to. to, to talk. Anyway, um, I wanted to say one other thing uh, really quickly, and that was on your on your idea of co-production really quickly, um, which I love. I love the idea. Um, I think that's a really valid point, especially when we're talking about ethics. Um, couple of, of points here. Um, and this is Lucy talked about this as well. And I, and I agree. The you, you talk in a way that that one of the solutions or one of the great outcomes, possible great outcomes or better outcomes, or more just outcomes of co production is that sharing of profits, right? Whereas Lucy, you, uh, uh, Shang Hong would say that, you know, oftentimes this is exacerbated, sometimes it exacerbates the haves and have nots to begin with, and the profits still stay uh, you know, with, with, with those in the local setting who have more power, uh, which is true. I would say maybe broaden the idea of, of sharing and, and, you know, sharing profit and sharing uh, capital to maybe a, a more equitable, you talk about maldistribution of profit. So maybe a better <laughs> distribution of resources in general, you know, because one thing that stood out to me again with this earlier uh, thing that we were talking with, with Chong Hong, is this idea that even though you know tourism has created these unintended consequences for the meow, people get by, right? We all have agency. We all work within the confines. Some of us have much broader uh, flexibility, and and some have much more narrow flexibility. But we, you know, you, we all have agency. There isn't any person that doesn't. Uh, we all think in in rationally and weighing different different objectives, even if it's not Western enlightenment rationality. But when resources are um, co-opted or not shared equitably, right? There's there, the, 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 the plane, the field narrows. And so the agency is less, you, you have less to work with, right? Less creativity to work with. So I would think about maybe thinking more about resources from the beginning, like who gets to utilize the resources not just economic resources, but cultural resources and natural resources and, and all of that. And then who gets to share in those in the future? This and the other, the next thing, and this is where I was questioning your co-production idea a little bit is knowledge as a resource, right? And, and I might be wrong. I, I, really, I really might be misinterpreting what you were writing. But for me, the co-production, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you were really focusing on the political end, you know, the, 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 the elites who are kind of uh, determining tourism uh, and heritage and the ways that it's deployed, the nation state or the, 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 you know, the government or something, and the locals, right? Neither of them necessarily have full knowledge. Both usually seem to be acting with this kind of weird skewed idea that, you know, tourism will generate profit, that if we create, it'll create, her we create heritage that will then add value and, and add profit and like Lucy said, it doesn't pan out that way. Um, there are other experts, right? Uh, you know, there, there are 
um, you know, the scholars, there are the conservationists, there are, you know, lots of different stakeholders that than just those. So I might have missed, you might have said that, but I, I might have missed that, that nuance there. But I would urge that we think about that. When you were talking about co-production, I was thinking, you know, I'm a museum person as well. I was thinking of Christina Kreps's really wonderful book. It's a little older, uh, where she's taught, I can't remember now um, exactly the title of the book, but it was about decolonizing the museum. Um, and she talks about indigenous co-creation, right? So not co-production, but co-curation. Co co I'm sorry, co-curation, curating. And we see this in the National Museum of the American Indian in, in Washington, DC, where the ex, it's not the government and, and the indigenous peoples are working together, but the, the, the Western uh, people with the technical knowledge are, 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 going, are, are working together with locals to kind of translate the technical knowledge of let's say how to conserve something, how to, how to foster tourism development uh, in equitable ways with locals who then say, you know, this is the way that it should, you know, that it should, that it should go. So I, I would kind of see the co-production co process goes through lots of different stakeholders as well. And then the final thing about co-production here is I didn't see any real mention of the tourists themselves in this at all. Does a tourist get to co-produce? Because, you know, they, and they should, right? Um, when I did, I think in, oh God, when was it? 2017, 2016, I had a, a given address in Florence at the, at the ECOMOS ICTC. They asked me, um, what's the anthropological perspective on uh, the sustainability of heritage tourism? I did this big uh, survey, uh, you know, open-ended survey with all these anthropologists from my organization, ATIG, but also the SFAAs uh, as well. And one of the most interesting points that a lot of people brought up is that we should be involving tourists, not the tour operators, not the government, the tourists themselves in the, in, in the production with locals uh, and the conservation of local sites. So like kind of give them that backstage kind of view of, of, of what the locals are thinking and going through so that their messages and their indigenous ways of curating, of, of caring for these objects, which could mean also letting them decay, are, are, are explained and, and, in, and they're involved in there. So that the co-production, right, to be more sustainable actually, you know, occurs also between the tourists and the locals themselves. And I think that this is actually really important because if you think about it, a lot of times, I'm being a little cynical, but the governmental agencies or whomever, are often really looking at kind of that bottom line and kind of predicting what tourists want. And then also, you know, kind of shifting where they think tourists uh, interests are, are, are shifting. I mean, I was a tour operator before I, I went into, uh, you know, into grad school. So I know that this is what we were trying to do. We were trying to predict and have a barometer on this. And so if tourists themselves continually start to change their minds or change their behaviors or change their needs or, or expectations, like we see students doing here at university, changing their, their expectations and, and demands of what they want out of school, then, the, then you get the, the upper level power brokers that might shift. I mean, a great example is you were talking about the Nanjing Museum. And the first thing I thought of is, you know, going to Vietnam for the last 20 years when, you know, the, the museum in the old embassy used to be called the, the Museum of, of American Imperialism, I think it was called. And before that, it was the Museum of like Chinese and American war atrocities. But, you know, by the time now you go there, it's just called the War Remnants Museum. All of the things like the, you know, terrible fetuses and pickle jars, you know, from, from Agent Orange, they used to be right at the top, right in front when you walk in, you know, look at how horrible. Now they're literally under a table. You have to really even look you know, to strain to even look there. This is because two thirds of those visitors are foreigners, Americans, French, you know, and uh, Europeans. And uh, I think that the sensibilities, the, you know, there's some sort of like, the tourists are kind of, they're, 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 they're reading the barometer on what, how tourists were reacting a little bit as well. There's also political things, we've normalized relations and so they don't wanna do that either. But I, I think, you know, that, that those things, I think we should really kind of consider uh, as well. Um, yeah, I, I'll stop there. I mean, there, there are a lot of other points that I could uh, that I could talk about, um, but I, but I think you know that's good enough. <laughs> thank you but thank much. you again for having me, and really excellent book. I really I really liked it.
And if you think he's a dynamic speaker, you should hear him in Italian. <laughs> Even more convincing. Uh, you, uh, I think that between the three of you, we've solved all the world's problems, but maybe I will ask you to talk about what they brought up and then uh, they could each have one rebuttal or further suggestion after that. So I'll turn it over to you, Yujia. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy and Michael. This is um, fantastic. Um, there's a lot of issue you have to you have engaged with deeply with the discussion here. Many issues that I have covered in the book, but also many issues I haven't covered in the book. As Michael mentioned, each project has its own limitation, but this is only a starting point of journey to evoke some ideas and, and thoughts, which exactly purpose of this forum that we often creates open discussions. Um, I really appreciate um, Lucy's point of view that we are coming us to think about um, um, the re re reconceptualization of heritage. Actually, it's one of my purpose uh, of this book is to welcome scholars to reconceptualize the idea of heritage and tourism. Um, it's, there are two ways to think about that. And I understand that from Lucy's point of view that uh, heritage should not only focus on the material and objects, but looking at it as a living space. This is a very powerful and strong and performative um, statement. And I go further a little bit to also think about that um, heritage tourism is not only an agent of change, as I quote from Lucy's work, but also we think about how it can change, which way to change, and, and what's the purpose of change. And that's why I'm thinking about tourism and heritage. I, if I come back to Michael's point of view, if we look at interaction between heritage and tourism, when these two ideas encounter each other at a particular moment, we are looking at their different ways of consequence. And I'm criticizing and reject the point of view that looking at as a short-term industry, that absorbing everyone, not only as Michael mentioned, the tourists, the agents, the stakeholders, the, the operators into the present, but also looking at in a long-term process um, that of agent of exchange and of mutual nourishment. So that's echo with Michael's point of view about sustainable development, which look at the whole thing as a, as a holistic picture. But I'm I'm not I'm intentionally not using uh, official term, which there are a lot of official term which we we we, we indicate, because um, lots of them has has become very powerful, like the one that I'm discussing, such as intangible culture heritage, eco museums or cultural landscape they become very powerful and sometimes very successful. And as a matter of fact, 2006, when I was working in the sustainable development of tourism department in World Tourism Organization, I participate in the drafting, the first outline of the idea of sustainable development. I was in the eighth floor in the SDT department and in the fifth floor of the building in Madrid, that was the Essex department. And we often talk to each other about each way because we are in actually in the same hierarchy, same department administration in the same sections. Both work in the same line, aligning with UN's um, millennia goals, but in different directions. And that time I'm working on the sustainable development uh, sections and trying to get a lot of inspiration from economic, culture, and, and environmental perspective as Michael just mentioned. But later I found that there's a limitations in terms of implementations, as Michael mentioned very beautifully, it's hard, not only about issue of balance, but how we can acknowledge from a holistic picture, because from everyone bringing their different intentions and interests. So it's, it's really not an issue about bringing a, a beautiful, a perfect model, but it's issue about um, collaboration and facilitation. So the idea of co-creation or co-production, um, I'm not intending to bring another model, but looking at two, uh, or two kinds of term uh, ideas that we, um, we intend to criticize, and one is about power. Both of Michael and Lucy has illustrated that beautifully that in the past decades, or maybe even longer from the 1960s, both heritage and tourism industries has experienced and witnessed the form of democratization 
So the power is not only belongs to the political centers, neither the international organizations, or um, um, belongs to the state, but the power also refers to individuals, especially the communities. So how we can facilitate and democratize the power and give agency back to the communities and also the tourists. I agree with you, Michael, that individual visitors, when they are traveling around, they also have the agency to shape their understanding, the knowledge about themselves and also about the others. So I think that's the idea of uh, mutuality and, and also um, gift exchange. Through mutual fertilization, mutual exchange, the co idea of co-creation is not led us to focus on benefits, but focus on something about exchange. Like the early criticism on civilization, that these days I'm looking at the idea of civilization, which often have the legacies of Western colonization and imperialism, but civilization should focus on the long-term process of exchange and mutual uh, fertilization. So this is the exact same idea for heritage tourism, which talk about the idea of power. The second issue is about time. So when Lucy encouraged us to think about heritage, not only about focus on the objects, but looking at living space, I think one of the particular element is very important here, not only on geographical space, but also about time. Time is important in this whole issue of encounter because heritage and tourism have different sense of temporality. And the tension and conflicts often arise because of the conflicts in terms of understanding of time. So again, when we look at when heritage meet tourism, as just addressed by Michael, we should welcoming both all the stakeholders to expand the idea of the present, which often just that moment, into something transcendent, into something as a long-term process, to look at the idea of exchange in a long-term um, um, process of, of dynamics. So that helps us to think about heritage tourism in a different way, again, as a reconceptualization and, and ideas. So I totally agree with uh, Michael's point of view that we shouldn't only um, looking at um, agencies from, uh, from local communities, but also tourists, because that's exactly the purpose of the idea of co-production, of co-creation. I also, and I also agree that um, the, the idea of ethics itself is limited. When I refer to social justice and ethics, um, like Tazim, that I went to back to Nancy Fraser. So that idea of justice is echo with the idea of politics of recognition. And that recognition have two dimensions. One is a cultural dimension about our identity. And another is the economic resources which is about recognition and redistribution of, re of resources. So I agree with Michael that both of these actors, factors need to be recognized in terms of how we manage co-creation. There are a lot of limitations in terms of empowerment because that's another fancy term from NGOs, and international organizations that requires us co-creation from different disciplines to work together. But, um, Again, I, record, I emphasize that soft skills is important. That requires a lot of issues about trust, empathy, to, and to help each other to understand what actually people means. Again, I use the metaphor of civilization here. When different culture or different people encounter each together as heritage tourism meet each other, we have different interests, different motivation, and different needs, economic, culturally, socially. That's why we need to surrender and sacrifice sometimes of certain needs, then we can actually meet and talk and understand each other. And that's the core issue of co-creation, which creates a certain sense of open discussion. Like in a university, we shouldn't always impose guest lectures or lectures, but it creates more time for seminars and, and tutorials. This is exactly that I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we can do in the idea of heritage and tourism context, create more seminars and tutorials and without imposing ideologies. So all the visitors and communities can have a sense of reflection 
about what can they learn through this experience and what they can gain from that culture exchange. I stop here shortly, but I really appreciate for the discussion and, 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 and co-creation of this seminar. I think this is only a start, uh, Lucy and, and Michael. There's a lot of time and opportunities I'm looking forward to that we can continue this discussion in many different kind of other format. And I also welcome that other people, especially practitioners, First Nation communities can include it in this discussion because not only a game for academics, otherwise it's, it's again a useless um, discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yujie. Um, I think in the uh, interest of time, I would like to let those who are not the uh, featured speakers today also have a chance to ask their questions or make remarks. We I know some people had to leave. We still have about uh, 20 people. So um, given that we're now in gallery view, would anybody like to put up their hand and I'll just call upon people in turn. Um, I see Dean, anybody else? Uh, Dean, why don't you start off? <clears throat> Uh, unmute yourself, please. You can all unmute yourselves. That's it. All right, thank you. Uh, the, first of all, thank you so much, Yuji, uh, for initiating this. Of course, you know that I know your book uh, and uh, appreciate it very much. Uh, the, <clears throat> the other thing uh, that I want to say before I say what I have to say is that the of the speakers, uh, I know you all, except for Lucy, and Lucy, I want to say that uh, it's a genuine pleasure to meet you and especially to hear what you have said. Uh, I, I was very impressed by your uh, response and uh, will remember many aspects of it. Uh, <clears throat> I, all I want to do is to, bring, is to underscore the old semiotician that's inside of me always and say that in this world, there is, I do not believe that there is, are any cultural forms left that have not been co-produced or co-created. Uh, that that concept is so fundamental to cultural um, um, development or, or change uh, that uh, I don't think that uh, there's any way that we should put brackets around it or try to think of it as something that's ultra special uh, only in the, in the heritage area. And uh, what you guys are all <clears throat> driving yourselves into uh, is the, the chaos that's been produced by basically the collapse of all of our paradigms so that we are now living in a world in which <clears throat> no one can make an assumption that there are naturalistic boundaries around our subject matters. There aren't any cultures left. There are no communities left. There are no cultural isolates left. Uh, and all of our uh, research uh, apparatus, our methodologies, and most of our theory <clears throat> is designed uh, for work in uh, a situation where you can make those assumptions about boundaries and uh, about clear-cut natural divisions uh, as being somehow meaningful. Uh, so uh, what I admire so much about Yuji's presentation is that he is basically taking on uh, the situation of our crumbling paradigms and allowing it to catapult him into a, a, a future where he has to start beginning to examine the ethical and the, uh, and the problematical power relations uh, that emerge uh, within this new situation. And I appreciate that very much. It's obviously a preliminary and pioneering work uh, and, and it has to go forward. But the thing that I would, I, th there's also an empiricist inside of me that won't go away. And I would, uh, also rec strongly recommend backing down a couple of notches and joining with Lucy and looking at the actual dynamics that are occurring in, con uh, in concrete situations 
that are being produced uh, by this uh, co-creation of the world symbolic order, uh, that we are all uh, actually uh, challenging ourselves with confronting uh, in our work. Uh, and so that's my piece. I'll shut up and, uh, and let others talk. Eugene, do you have an immediate chat? No, I, I, I can only just like applause and appreciate Thank you, Dean. Um, I appreciate I use this opportunity to thank you, Dean, to have the chance to read my work and especially the early draft of the work and also give a lot of encouragement to think about uh, these things um, and in particular also um, and appreciate for your critics. And I think this is very relevant and helped me to think about this um, issue further, um, actually, which has helped me to think about my next project in, in, in this. And, and uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Bert Gordon. Yes. Bert? Hello, everybody. And yes, Yuji, thank you for the presentation. And Lucy and Michael, it was all, all really fascinating. I learned a lot, a lot of sort of semi ideas floating around, have been crystallized a little bit more, um, including uh, the comment that was made. And um, I think actually, it was just Dean was alluding to this and cultural and, and boundaries, for example, that so often I found and I come more recently to tourism studies than many of you people do, but so often I have found this dichotomy between what Yuji referred to as marketing tourism studies and then social studies kinds of things that we do. And I think that uh, one of the great strengths, and I would certainly encourage you to continue in this direction, would be if you can take taking a global view that really incorporates incorporates the two. The other point or question if that sort of came to mind also usually as you were talking about um, your five ladders and interpreting step-by-step -step interpreting uh, tourism to Auschwitz and what has sometimes become ref called Auschwitz land and stories of people picnicking there and, and whatever. And um, this, I, I sort of had a couple of ideas in, in terms of, uh, you know, how does one, how does one actually approach this in terms of education and uh, conferring meaning to, to the people who come. And uh, as a que question of curiosity, I don't know the answer to this, uh, when Lucy, and again, I agree with what's been said, the comments that Lucy made were really, really wonderful, very, very incisive, uh, talking about profitability and how you look first to profitability, if I'm Hoping, hoping I'm representing what you said correctly and the impact that that has on heritage, how something like that would relate to a site such as, such as you know, the site of Auschwitz, for example. And um, lastly, of course, uh, Michael's point about talking about the tourists themselves. Uh, so I, again, I, I'm sorry to bring the sort of negative perspective in, but that popped into my mind immediately as uh, Yuji, as you were talking about the, the, the latter and the step by step by step sort of enlightening or for lack of a better word of, of your visitors and your tourists to the meanings of these sites. And then again, it kept popping back into my mind as, as the other two speakers spoke. And so I don't know if you if any of you would have any thoughts about any of that, but I would certainly be interested in any any comments or reactions. And again, again thank you all that really, uh, this was a fantastic, uh, fantastic seminar. I learned a lot. Are there any other people who are about to disappear would like to have something to say um, before the, the, we go back to the speakers? Anybody else, especially those from distant uh, uh, time zones such as Davis? Uh, Peg? Thank you. Well, Gongxi, all oh, you really uh, delightful, absolutely delightful. And just two very brief things, uh, one sort of ripping off of what Dean said in terms of culture. My mantra for many, many decades was something I learned from reading an anthropologist by the name of Cornelius Osgood, uh. who wrote about culture. And he, re he defined culture as being systems of shared ideas. And for me, that just has been the glue in terms of how I can relate as an anthropologist and how I can look my life. 
And uh, of course, I have this great maternal defense of UGA in terms of, uh, of focusing on uh, the tourists. And I am going to uh, blow a very uh, thin cover here. Uh, Walt and I are indeed Mar Marina, I think my name was Marina, and Johnson and UGA's first book. And he wrote about our experience at creating meaning as tourists uh, in this one particular venue in Lijiang. And uh, yes, that was our experience. And yes, we created our own meaning and we created our own aspects of, of, of relating to heritage in our own way and, and filtering through our own system of shared ideas. So again, thank you all. Thank you, Peg. Uh, a lot of uh, personal connections here, uh, as tourists or, well, uh, thinking tourists will put it. Um, would any of our speakers, uh, former speakers, like to have a comment? Eugene, did you have one? Eugene? Yeah, just uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a very quick one. So and let maybe also the other speakers to have a chance to talk the ideas. Um, I, I totally agree um, with all of your uh, points. I think it's very relevant and uh, very important. And, and just like Peggy's last point of examples that uh, individuals um, in that particular moment can create meanings and ideas, and that's become their personal heritage. And this is exactly the point of, of, uh, of culture and also, also my purpose to emphasize and push a bit on the idea of heritage tourism as a sense of uh, culture exchange. And, and a creation. And, and, and a bit more uh, push on at that notion is, I think it's, a, it's about um, and trans, the idea of transcendence, which, which I borrowed from the religious or pilgrimage um, context, that we, it's heritage tourism apparently help us to, to go beyond the present, whatever the present it, it is. So it's, it's help us to, to fulfill certain things, to exchange with others time and space. And that possibility can only be achieved through a certain sense of, of facilitation by a co-collaboration of heritage tourism at that moment. This can be uh, in the context of uh, Auschwitz um, uh, examples, as Beth mentioned, it's particular if we have certain kind of traumatic past, so it's transcendent to a difficult history to understand uh, the meaning, which I believe is, is still very challenging in many places, including Hiroshima and Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. Um, but also transcendence could be other things. It could be a, a nourishment to be a better person or, or, or better being and to understand more empathetic to the, the, the earth and nature. And I, of course, that's the a topic of climate change. So transcendence can be in two different ways. And, and the context of heritage tourism it matters. It helps us understand. But also the capacity of heritage tourism, I hope, can, can offer us that the generate the, the sense of, of transcendence, which I call it in my next project, which um, Dean, I, I just mentioned, is about heritage efficacy. Um, um, it's exactly the point of the capacity of that transcendence. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, Juliet said, uh, put something on the chat, which I think brings up a, another aspect of your tourist uh, uh, hosts uh, power dimensions, and I'd like her to bring it up. Maybe that would actually bring another dimension to our discussion. Juliet, please un unmute yourself. Unmute, please. Yeah. Well, he has to turn his off, otherwise it's double voice. <clears throat> um, a few years ago, these Viennese people came to Dean to, am I talking? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? yeah, they can hear you. Um, about uh, uh, participating in a thing called nano tourism research, in which the idea is that people, tourists, can bring their skills and talents to bear on local problems that people in a location have. And it's a very interesting thing. And then later on, Dean and I went to Hawaii and we both gave talks at the nano tourism conference. And I think it's going to get bigger uh, and more interesting over time. Um, I can't remember the name of the fellow who invited you, he's an Austrian, but anyway, the other thing I was questioning is 
there are places that have preserved their heritage traditionally, not, or not for the tourism's sake. I mean, thinking about cities like Paris and Chicago, just to begin with. Uh, <clears throat> there's things that were just preserved because the people, the people valued them. You know, they didn't say, yeah, let's get, just knock this thing down and forget about it. And that to me has always been much more interesting than anything that was concocted as heritage uh, or built or reconstituted, you know, like Lena's, Tetmeyer's, Detroit, slum, abandoned factories and things. It's, uh, yeah, anyway, that's my, that was my comment. Okay. Thank you. I'd just like to mention the case of the Palio of Siena uh, in Alan Dundas's uh, book about that, that the people who run the Palio of Siena, which is a big tourist attraction, were approached by some entrepreneurs said, you know, we could run the Palio in a number of cities uh, every week during the summer and the tourist season, you make a lot of money. <laughs> and they said, we don't sell the Palio, we live the Palio and we don't care whether there are any tourists here or not. Um, they immediately suggested that particular illustration even more dramatically than whatever Chicago does. Uh, yes, I see one or two other people might like to comment. No, I thought that a hand went up. Um, well, uh, do we have any more final comments uh, before people disappear? Thank you very much for the very powerful set of uh, remarks and, and case studies too, people have brought up. And Yujie, uh, just uh, would you like to expand a little bit on the next project? I mean, you know, we can have you maybe in a month's time talk about it. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for for welcoming. Again, I appreciate for all of your. Are you before everyone disappear? I, I I'm really appreciate for all of your contributions as this forum, as I said, as a co-creation, particularly to uh, uh, Lucy and Michael. Again, in this whole world, it's very hard to catch up with you guys, and I use this as a pre-Christmas gathering. <laughs> and also I'm very grateful for all of your co-creation uh, through your questions and comments, uh, which are, again, a, a sense of exchange and nourishment. And uh, this is all for us, a sense of comfort this, during this global crisis that matters to me. And hope that also helps you to think about many things. Um, my next project, or which I'm developing, is looking at um, the idea of uh, the historical perspective heritage in, in Imperial China. I'm looking at the cultural history of, of heritage, particularly looking at the role of which I call heritage efficacies in Chinese civilization. Um, instead of looking at um, heritage as a, as a form of industry, which we often engage with, uh, that we understand that we're discussing today, but I'm also looking at particularly um, um, it's as the uh, idea of heritage as a sense of exchange and, and sharing um, to, to contribute to, to contribute the sense of continuity in change. So there are two words here. One is about continuity. Another one is about change. And um, what I'm looking at is not just a overview of historical history. So I'm not a historic historian by training, I'm an anthropologist by training, rather using examples from Imperial China to look at four pathways of heritage practice. One is destruction, one is collection, one is transmission, and the last one is creation. And all of these four pathways, <laughs> um, look at examples of um, anti-Koreanism, material objects collections, or, or uh, knowledge education through uh, transmissions or rituals help us to understand how cultural civilization exchange um, and, and embedded in different power in different um, cultures. As some of you just mentioned that, oh yeah, Peggy mentioned that culture, it should be defined as a sharing knowledge. I believe civilization too, too that uh, um, heritage or the broader sense of heritage help us to understand that it's not really just about the conflicts and tensions or the power of the empire. Sometimes it's really about male dominance, but rather it's exchange between different power, different centers, different religion, different knowledge, different communities. And I hope that can be uh, just a glimpse of my next project. 
Thank you very much. And I would like to thank all those people at a great distance who are with us, not only you, Jay, but Gongna, maybe Beishi, uh, and Danyan, and Simona Keo hasn't told us where she is, but she's probably still in the Bay Area. Um, I actually, I just got an idea. Maybe both Michael and Lucy would very briefly like to tell us what their next exciting project is that we might hear more about in the year or two. Michael? I don't know. I, I have so many things hanging over my head right now. I have, uh, no, I, but I'm- one, This is gonna really happen. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I've, I've been working on, we have a handbook on, on heritage and tourism and another handbook on her, food and cultural heritage. And so that those are also very good. And I'm also behind in submitting a manuscript for, um, University of Toronto. That's similar. That's why I was so jealous of you, UG, because we're envious of, of how you wrote this, this book. Cause I have one for you, Toronto, that's on, uh, anthropological approaches to tourism that's supposed to be a real short one and it's for me it's very hard the to be who we work with left um, yes but it, maybe they've got another good one yeah. yeah they do but you know so it's like <laughs> i'm glad you knocked that one out <laughs> you know it's really fast <laughs> well thank you lucy well, um, if I might say, uh, Dean, um, I I'm very happy that you're there. Uh, I've known your work for uh, 30 years, uh, being a professor in, uh, in UCAM here, where you're very respected. Um, so it's, it's a great pleasure to meet you now. Um, yes, I am trying to finish a, a, a small book, uh, which is called in French, Emancipant Patrimoine, so Let's Emancipate Heritage, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, which I try to, uh, to address these questions of uh, heritage as a sustainable development tool or as an agent of transformation, as uh, Uji quoted uh, my work. Um, uh, and, uh, and going uh, towards uh, this notion of right to heritage, uh, which I want to explore uh, better. And, uh, and on a larger uh, scale, I'm trying to, um, to study, I am going to study the, uh, the role of heritage. I mean, not, not the virtuous role of heritage of bringing culture and, and, and so on, but what does heritage to a place and to people in, uh, in situations, particularly uh, deindustrialized places, but other places as well. Yeah. So how does heritage transform people and places? Of course, when it becomes heritage. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I hope that all of you have um, a good Christmas. If you yeah. are people who recognize Christmas or a good new year and everybody does recognize a good new year. And uh, in that new year, I hope we will see you all again. And I really look forward to the presentation of some of these wonderful ideas that our speakers and our questioners have brought up. Uh, and as I say, thank you very much for those of you who are with us from a long way away and uh, people like Yanis who had to go to sleep at 3 a.m. Uh, mm -hmm. after some of the uh, um, talk. So anyhow, uh, I'll say goodbye for now. And uh, we'll send out a call for your further activities and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. That's the new year in the Western calendar. It's not new year yet in some of your other calendars. So thank you. Thank you. For thank you. It was great to Dean. Thank you very much. Great seeing you too and, and Bert and, and Peg and everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank Good you to see you everyone. We have a recording okay. and it will be available, assuming that I can download it properly. <laughs> and <laughs> and early great greeting to everyone. Ha Christmas or All happy right. seasoning and New Year. Yeah, okay. you too. Thanks. Good you. to see you. Thank you all. Please all right, take bye -bye. care. Great. <laughs>